My name is David Keane with the RFU and you're very welcome to today. I am joined today by a host of experts from the playing, the coaching and the refereeing to hopefully give you a very enjoyable workshop where you will take a lot of questions uh, and thoughts away from it as well. Our aim today is for you, the audience, to watch games in a different fashion. We want you to develop your game by looking at games and asking questions and seeing different ways in which players that you see on TV go about their uh, their jobs in the different areas. And obviously today with the back row, then next next week when we kick off the Six Nations, we'd like you to watch these, these games and look at the uh, back rows in position and see, ask yourself the questions is, what position are they taking? What lines they're running? What actions are they doing? And asking yourself the questions yourself is, is what could I do in that situation as well? Firstly, I'd like to bring in our player and I'd like to introduce Anna Capeless. Anna Capeless, 14 caps for Ireland, um, Mallow RFC and currently playing her trade in Harlequins in London. Anna, hello and welcome. Hi David, thanks for having me. Thank you very much and it's great to see you and you're very good for giving up your time because we know you're, you're going into camp next week with the Irish team. So it's great to have you on and uh, sharing your expertise. So Anna, what I wanted to ask you was, as a player, you know, with you know, when you watch games as well, what do you, what do you look out for? Because I know as an elite player, you have the video analysis, which looks at lots of different angles and everything like that. But if you're like what the audience will be is watching the game on TV, what do you watch for in this? Yeah, so when I would be watching, you know, Six Nations or Champions Cup or whatever at home, um, around scrum time I get a lot of kind of uh, points to think about around back row in particular. Um, if you're a flanker what I would be looking out for is mostly body position at scrum time so are you know are both his knees on the floor or you know is is she holding back her prop or are they looking up or kind of things that you might notice about their body shape and then also for a number eight you know when might they engage or are they holding back their second rows? Little things like that. And you'll see that it differs from, you know, from team to team and sometimes from scrum to scrum. And one thing for me as well that I've watched out for is if I ever see anything change or I notice something that the number eight might do differently or maybe where the which channel the ball might come down and then pay attention to what might happen on the next phase. So, you know, if if you're watching the Six Nations in the next few weeks, not only look for what's happening at scrum time, but then what follows on from that as well. And, you know, see if you can pick up anything. And I think that when you notice these things that happen on the pitch, um, you know, yeah, I saw Kira Griffin doing this, you know, with, with, with the ball or with her body shape. And I saw Peter Romani doing something else, you know, um, speak to your coach about that and ask your coach, why why might they have done that? Or I think that this would be good for us. You know, it's, it's uh, about, you know, learning from the game and then starting those conversations like within your team, with your coaches, with your teammates, like something that I often watch out for um, is not just the back row at scrum time, but also the second rows. As a number eight, I want to see what they're doing. Do, is there a lot of movement in the scrum? And then talk to your second rows and see like, oh, did you see when they did that? That was really good or um, God, that didn't work out for them really well or, or whatever. So, yeah, there's um, you know, there's there's a lot of different things you can take away, but it's about how you apply it to your team and the scrum, you know, the scrum changes all the time and different teams are coming up with different tactics. So maybe you can, um, by keeping that conversation going with, you know, like I was saying with your coaches and your teammates, you can then build that into your own game, you know, when, when we all when we all get back to playing. So that's obviously, that's that's really, really useful. And, and, and what we've seen today is that's exactly what we want you know, the audience today is to, is to take that sort of attitude in terms of watching games as well. And as you said, it's starting those conversations and asking those questions and thinking about it and thinking about like, what would I have done in that situation? Or, you know, what is the player doing there? And I, like one other question I have for you as well is like, do you have any examples of, obviously you do watch that. Do you have any sort of examples of games that you watch that you actually, for you, have been very, very useful um, or even even people that you watch are very useful that have helped you in terms of develop your game by, by watching them and seeing what they do. Yeah, definitely. Like I think um, I well, 
you know, I'm a bit biased, but I think back row is like the best position on the pitch. And, you know, to watch like some of the best players in the world play in the back row. So I love watching like Sia Khaleesi and Michael Hooper. And what are really all, what always strikes me about those players is their work rate and how hard they work on the ground or their entry into the rock, like how physical and how effective that is. And then again, the kind of knock on from that. So how quickly the ball is then available because of the work they've done on the ground or how quickly they've been able to clear out. Also like their cheat lines, running lines, support lines, you know, the back row should have like, you know, some of the highest stats after every game. And, you know, when I watch players like that, it actually kind of inspires me and reminds me like how important that work rate is from a back row in particular. So yeah, over the Six Nations, like kind of pick out your favorite players and see how hard they work and then use that to inspire yourself and think about that player when you get back to playing and, you know, the harder you work, actually the easier your job will be and the easier you'll make things um, for, for the players around you. So. Yeah, I hope that's I hope that's helpful. That's really good. That's excellent, Anna. Thanks a million for that. And we may come back to you uh, and ask you a question um, later on uh, towards the end of this session as well. So next person we're going to bring in is the referee section. And I'm delighted to have the very, very famous uh, Joy Neville. Uh, Joy is also was also an international player in the back row. So we're very lucky to have an expert in both fields. And um, she played 70 times for Ireland. She also played for Munster and UL Bows as well. Um, she was World Rugby's Referee of the Year. Um, she refereed the last Women's World Cup final. And you can see her uh, regularly now on the Pro 14 circuit and also on the European Cup circuit as well. Joy, you're very welcome and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Mel Keener. Um, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I suppose what I hope to achieve today is to give a couple of tips. So look, how, how can you win those 50-50s or avoid being penalised? And I think the best way in doing that is, is, is showing the referee some good pictures. Now, you may still be illegal or, or not, you know, not sticking to the law particularly, but by showing those good pictures, um, you know, the referee may give you the benefit, benefit of the doubt. Uh, the second thing is knowing the law. And I certainly, from my own experiences as a past player, if I had known the law an awful lot more, I had no doubt that I'd be, I would have been a better player. So I know the, 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 the law book it can, be, it can be complicated. It has been minimised and it's a lot, a lot easier to read. So um, I would definitely recommend those in particular positions to, to read a couple of points. So just sharing a few points on the loss, just to, just to reiterate for anyone who doesn't know, a uh, player within the scrum may play the ball only with their feet, lower legs, but not lift the ball. So if that ball gets stuck in the center of the scrum as a, as a flanker, just, you know, if you know you can chance throwing your arm in there, but if 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 the sideline is calmed up, particularly AL, AIL level, um, that may be inputted. Or particularly if the if the referee is on that side, you know there's no point taking a chance. Use use the back of your heel if 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 need be. Um, must not bring the ball back into the scrum once it's left. That's more particular to the number eight. So. If the ball does exit the scrum and, and the ball is rehoofed back in, you may be in a position to be free kicked. Some some referees are are, are, are strict in that. Others may may allow you to do that. So again, it depends on on the, the individual on the day. Um, and the scrum half, I think this is a very important one, and I think Anna, you'd agree. Um, scrum half must take up position with both feet. So the scrum half must constantly be behind the ball. Um, close to the scrum and not in the space of the flanker and number eight. So when I say be smart here, can you see that picture, um, Keener? Yeah. Yeah. So nine obviously is in a legal position, but as a flanker, if if the nine does, um, if you can follow the arrow, go in between the seven and eight, as a flanker, you could be smart and bring this to the, to the referee's attention. Sometimes referees can be more focused on what's going on in the front rows. So as a flank, I'd be ref, ref, he's in an offside position, he's in between the seven and eight. And once the referee hears that, you're completely heightening their awareness. And if they don't penalise it um, on that occasion, certainly they'll look for it in the following occasion. Second thing, you know, which I know Anna does a lot, is stick out the outside foot and make it difficult for the nine to get into that, as close to that channel, making it awkward for the number eight to, you know, either 
pick and go or, or knock it on to the base of the scrum. Um, number eight can set up either in channel one or two. Sometimes you, you see number eight set up in channel one if, if they're up against a dominant scrum. So either channel you can set up on, but you can set um, engage in one channel and then swap to the second. Now, again, some referees are more strict than others, so it's a chance you're taking. Um, but just be aware of that if you are, um, if you are seen, you may be in a position to be penalised. And flankers must bind in their second rows and not um, on the opposition um, props. So as you can see here, Crote is um, bound on the back on the second row, uh, shoulder on, on the, the back side of, of his loose head prop. Perfect um, legal position. But once he starts driving in the opposition prop, again, a lot of referees allow this to happen and in some cases it's penalised. In most cases when it's penalised, it's when the referee is on that side or where the opposition scrum is more dominant and you have a flanker from the, um, from the non-dominant scrum reacting like that and, and um, scrummaging on the prop, you're completely highlighting that action and given that the opposition is, is more dominant, you're probably open to be penalised. Um, I hope that helps guys, just a couple of tips, tricks and um, I suppose be smart, the more, um, the more um, dramatic that you are or the more that you help the referee to uh, identify something, it may aid in, in gaining those penalties. Thanks a million Joey, that's, that's great, um, giving away too many secrets uh, of the dark arts. Um, and obviously, just to reiterate as well, is, is communication should be positive towards the referee uh, in, in, in that. Um, but thanks a million, enjoy. So the next would be our positional uh, presentation. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, Brendan O'Connor and JP Walsh. Uh, Brendan is a former Munster um, and Ireland Sevens player. It is a coach development uh, officer with Munster Rugby. And JP is a former Connacht Under-21 player um, and as a stalwart with both Westport and Ballina and is Connacht Rugby uh, Coach Development Officer as well. Um, so lads, thanks very much and I'll pass you on to uh, Brendan who will get you started. Um, from a point of view, what we're going to look at, the first thing we're all guilty of is having the phone while we're watching the game. And to be honest, we just need to park that, put it down and actually watch the game, not be on Twitter or Instagram or WhatsApp. I suppose a few things from my own point of view would have been take a few notes, be it mental or on paper. What did I notice from a back row's perspective? Times these happen, so make a note of what time maybe in the game it happened. What stood out? So, and then we say wonder how. So if it stood out like a Cale and Doris line break, it's not so much the line break I would worry about. It's how did that happen? What was the process before that? And rewind back and work back from there. So I just have about four clips here, guys, and we're going to look at um, different aspects of back row play and how we look at the game. So what we will notice in these are work rate, the second action, the effectiveness of those back rows on and off the ball. And off the ball maybe getting into position so we can be effective in that game. Impacts on the game, how we impact the game as back rows and focus on the hows I spoke before, not the result. So not the turnover because obviously we all see a great turnover, but maybe it's how did he get himself into position, which the next clip will show. So if we just, Turn down volume. So if we watch Michael Hooper here. There's breakdown one. You see him. He's always he's always alive and alert, but he doesn't burn himself into breakdowns. He doesn't throw himself in. And a lot of us would be guilty of just going into a breakdown, maybe for the sake of it, and it's dead as we call it, a dead breakdown. It's won by the opposition. And sometimes I suppose we're guilty of maybe if the All Blacks were playing here, we'd be watching the All Blacks and not watching what's going on maybe on the other side of the ball. So here's Hooper again. Third breakdown hasn't gone near it, fourth breakdown has a look, but also goes to the far fold around the breakdown for a defensive, so he's not burning a body in that defensive line. Fifth one, what does he see? Sees the inside cleaner maybe go past, so there's an opportunity for him, and how quick he is in on top of that ball to win a turnover for his team. So you watch four breakdowns where Michael Hooper's in around that breakdown, but leaves it alone, and on the fifth, he sees an opportunity because they haven't got gain line, and that inside support has overshot. He sees that window of opportunity. So there's something we might pick up as back rows on that. On this one, we've got Will Connors on debut here, guys, for um, Ireland against Italy. 
excellent at chop tackle focus, but what gets Will into that position for chop tackle? Danny Speed again here. This is a 30 second clip and watch how many impacts Will Connors has in this game. Caelan Doris has the intelligence here to leave the breakdown alone. Here he is here again, ball in the air, gets off the line as we see the defence coach call. Good chop tackle on his feet again. Has another cut, but watch him. If you were watching Will Connors from another angle, he's getting himself into, into position here to be effective again. So watch James Ryan shoot. He brings up the inside line. That's work rate, guys. That's, that's pure another work rate to force a turnover. As well as being effective, he's effective in what he's doing off the ball, getting there early enough so he can have those impacts on the game. So we go to the next one. We've Dave McCann playing for the Irish 20s last year. So this is just to show how effective he can be on and off the ball. So Dave McCann is highlighted here. You see him make the tackle here. So he's effective off the ball by getting into the position to make that tackle. And now this is how he's effective off the ball again. We'll see him highlighted again and his work rate. So the ball is turned over. What's Dave McCann doing as a back row? He's here, he's in around there. And now he sees an opportunity. He looks to get there. The biggest thing I saw in this clip is not, it's more here. Watch his head, watch what he's looking at. So he has a look who's in support, but he also looks up to see who's defending him. Sees the opportunity, goes at the line. He knows how's outside him because he's already had a look. He's already had that head on a swivel, as we call it, and he's effective. And that JP will cover later on his support play then as well. This one, I think this is a super clip just for the instance of watch the back row as a unit here, as a whole unit. We'll watch the back row. So watch Tommy and CJ get around the corner. Just, I'd like you to count how many impacts these back rows have each on this phase of play. I think it's 50 seconds of a clip. So there's CJ and Tommy up again. Goes around. So they're always moving, they're always scanning, they're always getting into position. So here we go again, they're off the line, stopping that gain line as we speak about. CJ leaves it alone, he's the intelligence, Andy tells him leave it alone, so he does. Peter's out here, watch Peter get off the line, put pressure on here, make the tackle. What's Peter's thought, thought process? I would be asking for watching Peter and CJ. Get off the ground, work right again, get into position. So here he goes, who makes the second tackle? Peter, made the one previous, makes this one. CJ sees the opportunity, in he goes, seals it. So from a point of view of a back row, there's work rate right there, there's opportunity, seeing opportunities, not just going, they're seeing opportunities, but that's what are they doing off the ball to be able to see those opportunities. A lot of it comes down to work rate, right, as Anna spoke about, and then just good, good, intelligent rugby about when the opportunity is there to go. Um, we'll just move on. So I just spoke to John Hodnett very briefly about what he's looking at. Hello, John Hodnett here. Uh, a couple of things I keep an eye on when I'm watching a rugby match is, um, especially with the back rows, is their uh, work rate, physicality, um, especially in terms of tackle, uh, rook and carry, um, especially the decisions around um, whether to go for a poach or whether to fall or not and do their impacts um, make a positive influence on the game. So you take a kid like John Hadnett who has come through a club system uh, playing with Clannock Kilty, then into an academy and um, playing with UCC and AIL and now playing Pro 14 and European Cup Rugby. And he, that's what he looks for from a back row. The same as Anna spoke about, he's looking for a lot of things from a back row. And, and just, I would say to you, watch the back row, okay? So when we're watching rugby, let's watch the back row. Even if we watch the game as a whole to start with, let's start to watch our player in our position of what they're doing off the ball to get themselves effective on the ball or vice versa. So if you just watch there, all these pieces, we go back. So I just put it together to make the last clip go like that. So it's it's looking at all the process to see how, so you watch John there who was circled come back, get himself into an effective position, look, scans to see what's going on to get on a ball. And then he calls for it, he looks for it, he sees something in front of him. How can he be effective? Goes for the space, there it is. But it's what has John done before that to get into that space. So I'd like to thank you for anything there, and I hope I covered off and helped you on that, but it's very much so 
watch the player in your position, see the effectiveness and the impacts they make as, as a player, as a whole back row, what, if, what impacts they have on that game. So I'd like to hand you over to JP, who will cover a bit more around ball, ball play and support. So thanks very much. Hi, everyone. Um, is that chair in there? Lovely. Um, so thanks for that, uh, Bach. Um, so just what I'm going to look at here is is uh, back row support play. Um, and when you're watching a game and, and what you're noticing and, and then wondering how, how do they go about that. But but before we just get into the video clips, um, let's look what let's look what makes up a, a good back row's DNA when it comes to uh, support play. Um, it's not tactical, technical or by chance. It's through hard work. You're going to hear about hard work a, a good few times this presentation. So you're looking at work rate, tracking, positioning, scanning, link play. No talent required NTRs. Uh, any good back row, most of the good stuff you, you, you'll see that they'll do when you're watching games on telly. There's no talent required to it. And you're going to see through a lot of the, the, the footage I'm going to show here that you're going to hear me mention NT, NTRs. So just going to go to the first clip. Sorry, one sec now. Just looking at Sean O'Brien here. In the defensive line, New Zealand are in position. Okay. At this moment, Sean, as anyone would be thinking in the position that the lines are going to clear their line. But Lee Williams thinks elsewhere as why. So straight away he's kicked into gear. Okay. Now he's getting that he's in support there. You see how hard he's working now. Once the tackle's made, if the breakdown is there, he's there. Now he sees straight away that it's on again, that there's space. So now he's going to angle his run. Keeps running. He's in support. And he's there to score one of the best tries there has been scored so again when you look at that like and Sean would have got a lot of uh, 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 plaudits for that but again there was no talent required there it was just being smart working hard scanning seeing what was on so we're just going to look at a different clip here okay so this is our first phase Kieran Reid You can actually see he's actually fighting to push some of his own players out of the ways because he wants to get to that breakdown. But now actually tackles miss, so there's a line break on. A lot of traffic there to get through. But straight away, that acceleration to offer himself needed. He wasn't needed. He was there. New Zealand scored a try. So you, you, you wonder, when you're watching, we, we, we get you to watch games over the next couple of weeks, and when you see someone scoring a try, just stop and see who's actually around them and wonder then and, and notice how did they actually get there? And if you go, if we go back to what I said in the beginning, there was actually no talent required there. It was just being smart and he wants to be there. That bit of acceleration to, to, to be that support player. Another clip here, okay, Scott Barrett. Again, back rows, loads of different different roles, creating, creating a bit of space there to, to, to put Carberry through. But it's all about what we do. We always talk about what's your next job. So after your pass, what's your next job? So in this instance, he when he makes the pass, he takes a lot of heavy contact. And a lot of players will just stop it. He doesn't. Straight away, that acceleration out of it, because he knows that if he gets on that inside shoulder, quite possibly he'll get the ball again. And he's there to help out the team. So once again, wasn't involved in, in, in the, didn't score the try, but just he was there for support if needed. So it's really important, I go back to that, that you notice these things when watching the game and then actually go back and see exactly how did they do it. Different picture here, okay? Sometimes we find ourselves uh, as forward on the edge and sometimes you're just standing, you're just there shepherding the ball to, to the out half. You will offer if you need it, you will carry. But it's what, it's what the, the South African seven does after this. Being smart, again, see there's an overlap. So he's not running towards the ball, he's running ahead of the ball. So he knows he's going to be in a good support when they do make that line break. He's a big man, covers a lot of ground, but he's been very smart about it. Gets on the end of the ball. Okay, I won't show the rest of the, the, the clip because his skills let him down a small bit. But uh, just, just showing about being that smart, being smart, running those. We hear about scrum halves all the time, cheat lines, but back row can do it, especially on the edge when you've got a fast winger that's going to make that line break. Come back to first phase. 
So this is, I think this is an excellent clip this is from our, our Connacht 18s two years ago. And if you watch our two back rows, especially our six, Soon two players get up, they're scanning. Seven is tracking, working really hard. Watch six coming into view now. Straight away, he sees the line breaks on. He's not running towards the ball. He's just trying to keep up. So he knows that if it breaks down, he's in a good position to be either there as support or if, if, if needed, he'll hit the rook either. So again, they're all stuff that there's absolutely zero talent required for. So we go back to the beginning, what we said about your work rate. And that's what we, we'd love to see when you play a game that people will notice about you. So I know from watching these webinars all last week, there's been a lot of questions and we're not meant to get into drills and how, how, how you, you do this. But for me, I think the best example is, I just could show you a quick video. It's just training from our under 17s. Um, every game, this is only a 5v5, but every single game and every opportunity you get when you're on the pitch. Pitch is about 50 meters long. Every time, get the ball through as many hands as possible. And straight away, it's one guy, whoever's going over the line, everyone is in picture. Going back to the, going back to the, uh, the Scott Barrett one, where he takes the contact. So it's really important after you make your pass that we, we you, you'll hear it, stay alive. So the seven started the move there, but he was there to finish it by staying alive. He didn't admire his pass. He went to, in, in support straight away. So these are the bits we, 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 wa we want you to notice when watching games on TV. Um, I love this quote, and especially when it comes to back row, uh, I don't believe in magic. I believe in hard work. But for myself and Bach on this, so over the next couple of weeks when you're watching, uh, when you're watching games live on TV, Let's list the NTRs, the no talent required you see, but then list them for yourself and what you want people to see when, when watching you play. So that's all for me. Um, thanks very much. I'll hand you back to Dave. JP, Brendan, thanks a million. It's absolutely fantastic the fact that, I suppose for the audience as well, is, is going forward that you're watching the game and what you, you two have done within that presentation is it actually looked uh, of a wider view in terms of watching your own position, the lines are running, when to go in for a ball, when not to go in for a ball. That is brilliant. It just gives people a whole new way of watching a game because now they can actually develop their own position. Thanks a million for that. So the next person I'd like to bring in is, is a coach's um, perspective. And Tom McKeown has nearly 200 appearances for MU Barnhall in the all Ireland League. Um, he's up there with one of the most experienced uh, players there is. He's also the um, development manager for um, Maynooth University. He's a former rugby league international and also a former snooker international. Uh, Tom, you're very welcome and thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Keener. Very elaborate uh, introduction. Um, yeah, so and thanks, thanks to the panel so far. Um, I'm just going to put up a short presentation. Um, um, so just to establish the realities of the game, but, but really at the level that you coach at, so, I mean, what I mean by that is there's no point taking um, elaborate plays or aspects from the pro game and trying to uh, shoehorn that into underage setups. If you are coaching those levels at boys or girls, or if you're a player, making sure that you're realistic in your targets. So you're looking at stats that you see on the screen, which we all do and we all enjoy to, but you're relating that to your game. What's a good target for you? We saw in the second row presentation, there's, there's, there's players hitting 20 odd tackles but realistically, it all relates to what level you are playing or coaching at. So just making sure that we, we are realistic in that, that approach. Um, but we're also identifying the multitude of skills that a back row uses. Just for example, if Anne is going into camp next week, um, there's a good chance Adam Griggs could, could ask her to lift in a line out, jump in a line out, carry the ball off first phase, uh, be the first cleaner off first phase. So it's really just identifying and, and, and linking back to what Bach and JP have said. There's, there's just so many uh, skills required. The core skills have to be really on point if you're going to be an effective back row. And also making sure that as a mini unit, as a mini unit of back row players, that we have the correct balance in our team. So just re reiterating what Bach has said, watching Ruby, putting the phone down, watching it with a bit of a critical eye, linking it to your game or your coaching and how, how you can improve it. Identifying role of the back row players in two situations. I've just given these two to, to, for you guys to mull over. 
First phase, so we spoke about all those uh, different types of roles, uh, both in attack and defense. So if I'm using Anna as the example, if Anna's going to be the first cleaner in a, if the play results in a breakdown, she's there. If it's defense, she may be the first player to arrive at the rook to put pressure on it or not. As Bach highlighted with Michael Hooper, you might bide your time for the third or fourth phase when there is an opportunity. Then it's just characterizing the two the skills into the, and we're going to delve into this a little bit more, and Bach mentioned this, into on the ball and off the ball skills. So on the ball, I've just picked a few out. There's obviously more and not claiming to be the oracle. So when you, when, you, when you go away or you're looking back on the presentation, feel free to, to disagree or add things in. I've put in just on the ball skills, maybe from, from, a, from an attack uh, point of view, and John Hodden has mentioned it there, being a dynamic ball carrier, using those feet, have an offend, fighting in the contact and finishing, and ensuring that we, we can achieve, as it says below, lightning quick ball. So trying to set up our team from first and second phase to really have an opportunity to attack and score. So being effective at the breakdown, okay, if you're the first arriving player, if there is a breakdown, that you're effective in that role, you've got a good body position and you know what that looks like. Slow in opposition post tackle, we just mentioned as well. Maybe you have a bit of a superpower within your team, you have a good offloading game. Okay, we've seen Ulster doing it an awful lot in the last few weeks and probably doing it more so now that they've signed Nakarawa. That if you have an offloading game, it's really in, invaluable. It's superb, especially against organized defenses these days. If you have the ability to keep the ball alive, be it lateral pre-contact or just post-contact in, in the space behind the tackler. Um, and then from on the other side of the ball in defense, being an effective destructive tackler making the correct tackle selection and, and Bach mentioned this in his in the tackle technique are you going to be low are you going to be chop focused or are you are you a bigger hitter are you going to be more ball focused in the collision and that probably joy would probably be concerned there if you get it wrong um, it's sort of risk versus reward if you get it wrong you could be on the sideline if you get it right you can really slow down play uh, of the of the of the, the opposition off the ball um, JP mentioned, gave some superb examples there. Your support play, your link play, taking those cheat lines. We've heard it mentioned in all of the position specific uh, workshops or presentations this week or last week, where we're not going to the starting line, we're going to the finish, finish line. So we're going as the crow flies. Good examples uh, from the South African six, going on that diagonal line uh, and, and really, really supporting the, the line break. Decision making, where are we needed next? And that's that's pretty much where experience comes in. It's it's really rare to see, and it's, that's where we see guys going into the pro game and girls going into the provincial and international setup where they have a bit of a natural understanding of the game and they can kind of feel where they're required next. Where am I of most use to my team, whether it's attack or defense? Uh, being an organizer, leading your defensive setups from first phase. So making sure we have good connections, we're identifying space and attack, but equally, we're identifying uh, problems in defense or trends. If, if, if an attack, uh, if the opposition is attacking a certain way and they're really picking on certain weaknesses of, in your team and every team has a weakness, that you can you can identify that and you can communicate calmly to your, to your teammates that this is, look, listen, this is how we're going to adapt and overcome this. So you're really being a problem solver as well. Um, I think just the traits from a, from a coaching perspective, um, I suppose, Look, they need to have uh, high levels of aerobic and anaerobic, obviously uh, levels, uh, power endurance. So that ability um, and and the two presentations showed it, showed it numerous times, those repeat efforts, the ability to get up, to go again. And I think that's something that's probably not emphasized enough is that our, the, the ability to get up off the ground and get back in the game and have more involvement is a skill. But also it's probably not necessarily a talent as JP highlights, it's probably just a bit of desire. And that links to the next one where we say, obviously ultra competitive, it's hard to say, listen, you've got to have desire to get up off the ground, unless you're really, you've got the mentality of being ultra competitive. So just having that nature about you, whether you're playing in, in, in underage rugby club, club land or provincial or international, it's, if you're in the back row, you're probably going to have um, a competitive nature. Um, as Anna said, it's the best position to play anyway. Um, and then good game understanding, as we mentioned in the previous slides, student of the game and this is what this is all about when you go to the when you're going to watch the matches really have a look at the positions not just your own in this case and try and take some notes as box said and um, proficiency off both sides 
and this is just something I, I, I find a lot with, with kind of um, mid to late teens. We find that they're very one side dominant and you can see it in, in adult rugby as well, where they might be very good tacklers off one side, very good passers off one side. They might have a very good handoff off one side, but not necessarily both sides. And that's really what can set you apart. So if you're if you're an underage player, a girl or boy looking at stepping to the next level, if you've got that ability to go either way and you've got you, you can keep the ball alive, you've got a handoff, you can pass. It's it's really it's really massive uh, strength for your team if you can. And then just, I suppose, just a little quick summary. Um, excellent core skills. That, that's across the team, but I think it's more highlighted in the back row mini unit, where you've got to be able to catch pass because you've got to be able to link play. You've got to be able to tackle in probably more than one way effectively. You've got to be very good in the ball carry, and you've got to be really, really um, effective at the breakdown. And um, We've mentioned that competitive streak. The good game awareness we've already mentioned from a structured and unstructured game point of view perspective. And remember, if you're watching this as an underage player, the vast majority of your game is unstructured and from counterattack and turnover, etc. So it's really if you can get good at that, the first phase stuff a coach can give you. And then from a coaching perspective, establishing a good balance in your back row player skill set. So that mini unit. So if we have a really good ball carrier, we can maybe afford to have someone else who's really exceptional, a seven on the ground and competing for possession, and then maybe an eight, a number eight who links that all together. So just getting that balance right and linking it to maybe your game plan or the identity of your of your own team. So uh, that's that's really it from me, Keener. So yeah, I hope there's, a bit, there's a bit of food for thought yeah. there. Absolutely. Um, I suppose Tom just sort of highlighting, you know, what the coach is looking for in turn then the audience in terms of watching games in terms of how do they get to that how do they get to that level or how do they even just improve their own skills uh, to the next level in which which they're at as well so that brings us to the end of the structured part of the of the workshop um, so for those of you who have other things to do um, you can log off and this still will be recorded and the questions and answers which we'll be running now will be emailed out to you as well so if you have other things to do um, please feel free uh, to go. But we're going to ask a few uh, questions of our experts now that have been sent in to us. Um, so we're going to we're going to do that now as well. Uh, apologies about some of the techie sessions earlier on, uh, techie issues earlier on. But let's just get into the Q&A now. So my first one is for Brendan. So Brendan, um, just one of the questions that have come in are what are academy coaches looking for in a back row? Suppose. Um there's a few non-negotiables around work rate and, and they're looking for fellas, I suppose, to have points of difference in their game in that they're, they're, they're studious to the game, but also dynamic ball carriers. I suppose the one thing about a back row is he covers, he ticks a lot of boxes. She, he, she, he, she ticks a lot of boxes around what they have to be able to do. But th there's non-negotiables there around their, their work rate and what they do, their effectiveness in the game, obviously the impacts they can have on a game. Um, their diligence, obviously, from their own point of view of how they look after themselves, how they, they go about playing their game, etc. But from an academy point of view, I suppose it's, it will come back to work rate because skills can be worked on. The desire, as Tom spoke about, that kind of, if they go out and watch a game, they want to see fellas that are putting themselves in those positions to make, and smart rugby players, intelligent rugby players, around where do they see the opportunity to maybe poach a ball, to carry a ball, etc and have, I suppose, try and um, broaden a wide range of skill in what they do. Lovely. Thanks a million. Uh, can I bring in Anna next? Um, Anna, we have a question in here is, how can I as a number eight help the nines job easier? So maybe you could answer that one for us. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, again, it's about kind of talking conversations in training, um, but I think it depends as well on the opposition. So if you've done analysis and you know that, you know, they've got a really uh, annoying scrum half and the other team that's going to put a load of pressure on your scrum half, you know, maybe practice that week, like popping from the ground and standing your ground. So like turning your back towards that um, scrum half and maybe letting that scrum half hit you before you get rid of the ball. So you've taken that hit away and given the, the nine some extra space. Um, yeah, uh, there, there's there's lots of ways of doing it, but I think um, always always turn your back to the scrum half is probably um, a good place to start and stay strong and anticipate taking that contact. Um, and then, like has been said so many times, once you've taken a hit, 
follow that nine then and follow your path and, and support them that way. Thanks a million. That's that's fantastic. Uh, JP next. Uh, JP, um, just on that, any specific work socks we could work as a back row? Any workouts? Um, Some kind of exercise maybe you could do at home or something that you can... I, I suppose at, at home at the moment, um, look, when you're you're on your own and, and uh, it's it's you, you think it could be difficult, but there is, yeah, there's one, uh, any player I'm dealing with at the moment uh, for, for especially back rows, the game has changed a lot and you get bigger men and the day of just running over uh, players, that day is gone. Okay, we, we want athletic guys, so we want guys to actually have good footwork. So it's easy to put a post or something in the middle of your garden and just uh, running up to it and then chopping your feet, slowing down your feet and getting that bit of uh, footwork uh, to avoid it. And also um, uh, just accelerating. So you want to change up. If you're going into contact, you're, we're really looking for players to accelerate into it. So again, uh, when you're getting on, getting the ball past you, just that a bit of acceleration at home. So yeah, for any good rugby player at the moment, uh, and you, you can see for all those those clips, the bit of change up footwork was a big part of it. So that's definitely something you can work on at home at the moment. That's brilliant. Thanks a million, JP. It's great. Uh, come to Joy, uh, last but not least. Uh, one of these, uh, the question we have in here, and it's one probably that uh, creates discussion on the field um, as well as off it, is um, can a flanker break off the scrum once the nine has the hands on the ball? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the answer is no, and it's just the same as the base of the rock. Nine having the hands on the ball isn't sufficient to say that the, the rock is over or the scrum is over. The nine has to lift or the eight has to has to be seen that the ball being lifted from the ground. And likewise, just to double up on something I should have clarified earlier on is the number eights. When is when is the eight broken his bind or her bind? Its shoulders have to be attached to the, um, the back sides of, of the second rows. Once there's a separation from, with the shoulders, if the ball, even as he's lifting or she's lifting the ball, once the, the shoulders have, have uh, broken that bind, um, you can consider the eight being um, broken from the scrum. But be smart there again, because again, you want to make sure that the referee is on the same page. The referee may feel that the eight's still bound to that scrum. Be smart and say, ref, but by um, shoulders bind is broken. You know, can I, can I make tap? Just, just be smart. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.